Who owns a discovery? Is it the discoverer or is it their place of work? These questions were precisely at issue with the case of Peter Taborski. Taborski was born in 1962. His family came to the United States in 1968, fleeing political turmoil in Czechoslovakia. Taborski was an inventor from an early age, filing for his first patent at age 16. In 1986, Taborski enrolled at the University of South Florida with a double major in biology and chemistry. He worked part-time as a lab assistant for Dr. Robert Carnahan. In 1986, Taborski was performing laboratory test research in Carnahan's lab. This research grant only lasted three months, and at the end of it, Taborski was discharged from that contract work, but he was still working for the university on a different account under the same person. Taborski then began working on his master's project, which was upon the physical properties of aluminosilicates that resemble commonplace kitty litter. Taborski discovered that heating the material beyond 850 degrees centigrade improved its capacity to be reused in wastewater treatment. Because of his prior experimentation, Taborski went to Dr. Carnahan and informed him of the results, believing that they would be valuable to wastewater treatment companies with reusing one of the materials in their process. Carnahan told Taborski he suspected this discovery would be owned by the University of South Florida. Carnahan also told Taborski that he would be prosecuted and incarcerated if he filed a patent on the discovery or attempt to publish the result on his own. Taborski met with a company called Florida Progress, which offered him a job based on his master's research. He refused the job offer, and on January 6, in 1989, he filed a patent application for his discovery after leaving the University of South Florida. He left abruptly with two notebooks from the laboratory in which he had made the first discovery. When Carnahan found that the notebooks were missing, he called Taborski and left him a voicemail message threatening him with prison if he didn't return the notebooks. Can you imagine that? So there's like a bunch of drama between Taborski and the university, which culminates in Taborski getting convicted of grand theft and theft of trade secrets and sentenced to 15 years of parole in January 1990. One of the conditions of the sentence was that Taborski return all of his research materials, but Taborski, being the king that he was, did not do that. On January 24th, 1991, the Patent Office denied Carnahan an application and awarded the patent to Taborski. Taborski was also awarded two other patents for this aluminosilicate process. The university took Taborski to court for violating a parole agreement. He was then sentenced to three and a half years in prison. Taborski even did eight weeks on a chain gang. Local press covered the story and he was removed from the chain gang because of the Florida correction secretary. And the governor even offered to pardon him. Now, dear viewer, do you think Peter Taborski accepted that pardon? He did not, on the grounds that accepting it would have been an admission of guilt. Quoting Taborski from his radio interview, I am seeking justice and seeking the truth. What actually happened? What were the contracts for? Where did the money go? And all those sorts of things. Those things will vindicate me. They will show I did nothing wrong. Taborski served a year and a half in prison, four months in maximum security, two months on a chain gang for stealing two notebooks from his college. Taborski has since moved to the Czech Republic, and can you blame him? He is now an associate professor at Masaryk University. So you may be wondering, Avery, what's the point of this? This is an education class. Other than this being at the context of the university, why did you just do a four minute procedural drama? Well, my friend, the Taborski incident is indicative of larger trends in the American university, where the university has become the site of production for patented knowledge which can then be used for a profit. This is one part of neoliberalism. Neoliberalism relies on the, quote, marketplace of ideas, unquote, as a core doctrine, according to economist Philip Murawski. The marketplace of ideas is a euphemism for the computational market or a market as an information processor. In this view, the market system 
is a mechanism by which new ideas are produced through the aggregation of everybody's disaggregated economic activity and intellectual activity, in the case of science. In the neoliberal view, the market is the superior information processor to the human brain. A simpler way to say this is that no one is as smart as the market is. The privatization of the university plays an essential role in this process. Neoliberal thinkers such as Milton Friedman cared immensely about that project of privatizing all public schools and universities. When the university or the school is private, it is run like a business. And when something is run like a business, things like the Taborski incident are more likely to happen. Ideally, school would always be the place of self-knowledge, but business incentives obstruct that. The Taborski incident is a particularly dramatic example, but it is illustrative of a greater phenomenon through which our instructors live and the consequences of which we are now living as students. Privatizing the university, commodifying education, and enforcing obedience to markets are all part of the neoliberal project. I view neoliberalism as just one part of a human shift toward computationalist influences on our lives. By this I mean, not only are markets defined as computers, and not only is education commodified, but life is defined as computational, and almost all aspects of life are financialized. This social-cultural change is concurrent with the invention of the computer and the proliferation of personal computing instruments into daily lives of basically everybody. Here I would like to focus back on education for a moment. In her 2012 work, How We Think, Catherine Hales writes a chapter called How We Read, Close, Hyper, and Machine, which discusses the influence of digital media and computational devices on the reading techniques of her students. Hales considers three types of reading, close reading, hyper reading, and machine reading. Close reading is defined as paying a lot of attention to the particular interpretations of a text rereading it over and over and looking for hidden esoteric meanings that the author may be trying to convey to you. Hyper-reading is skimming, looking for important passages or phrases, and like generally trying to find the most important piece of information from a document, maybe comparing two documents or sections of documents, but not reading something in its entirety and like looking for the esoteric message. Hales argues that students do a lot more hyper reading because that is the type of reading that is encouraged by our media devices like cell phones, computers, iPads, etc. Young students, I should say. She argues that education classes typically teach close reading and that this does a detriment to students who spend a lot of their outside of class time doing hyper reading. Because of this, Hales would encourage teachers to allow students to hyper read in different ways in the classroom as well. She also discusses ways that machine reading and like AI algorithm of different texts may be used in the classroom to aid students understanding. But because I understand that type of stuff less, I just can't really comment upon it. How are these ideas connected? Computerization. The trend in the 20th and 21st centuries is towards digitization and computerization of everyday life. In this sense, neoliberalism and the computational view of markets is just one part of a broader shift in human experience. The Taborski incident is tenuously linked to the computer, but it is linked to the neoliberal trends in the university. Recall that neoliberalism is the view that the market is the best information processor ever. A logical consequence of this view for scientific research is the privatization of the university and its research activities. We see this in the hostile reaction from the university system to an undergraduate student perceived as undermining their intellectual property rights. The computerization of education is linked intimately with commodification of education and the neoliberal university system, at least in the American context. Our classes, by and large, are online lately. This was a trend even before the pandemic. The virus has only accelerated the process immensely. In what ways has the existence of the computer affected your education, both literally and in discourses about computational objects? And how has the commodification of education affected your life? With these questions in mind, I would like to recap and wrap up this video. 
So we began with a procedural drama to illustrate the way that universities and colleges are like businesses and firms. Then we discussed how this influence is neoliberal in nature and briefly touched on the commodification of education. Then we discussed how neoliberalism is related to broader trends in human culture of conceptualizing almost everything as a computer. And finally, we briefly discussed the ways in which computers have affected how students read in the classroom and how teachers can adjust their curricula to accommodate those different reading styles among students. Did you relate to any portion of this? Please let me know. It could have been the school as a business and it could have been a classroom not accommodating your reading style. I would also like us to critically interrogate the ways in which computerization affects our education. I would love to hear your experiences. To write this video essay, I used Science Bought and Sold by Philip Morosky and Esther Mirjam Sent, and Science Mart, The Privatizing of American Science by Philip Morosky. I also used two lectures, which I have listened to repeatedly, that Morosky gave about his book Science Mart, and I will link those in the description below. I was also influenced by a book called How We Think by Anne Catherine Hales. My Mother Was a Computer, also by Anne Catherine Hales, and The Cultural Logic of Computation by David Columbia. Thank you for taking the time to watch my video essay.